Hello and welcome to a fresh new edition of Bazaar Morning Call. I'm Prashant Nair. With me, my colleague Sonia and Reema joins us on the program today. Guys, hi, good morning. Hi, good morning. Uh, chugging along to the end of the year, uh, slowly but surely. <laughs> but, uh, you know, we've got markets which are giving us absolutely no help, right? Confusing uh, signals. Confusing signals and huge moves. Uh, and that's essentially what I want to start with today. Uh, you know, just look at the last five days on the Nifty, right? That's, that's it. I mean, look at that. This is nothing but uh, the day's close uh, as compared to the intraday high or the intraday low. Yesterday, the market sold off 274 points from the intraday high. Uh, or the day before, the market jumped 185 points from the intraday low. Uh, the day before that, that is the 19th of December, we got 165-point bounce from the lows of the day. And then uh, cumulatively, the, the previous two sessions, we had a 300-point uh, sell-off from the intraday highs. So, so this is a very large uh, sort of intraday range that we're talking about, about day after day. Actually, and, the chart uh, really looks like, you know, so one of those roller coasters that you have in those amusement <laughs> parks. You don't know when there's going to be that steep fall. One thing is sure, Sonia, right? You don't, you basically don't want to do anything right at the word go. That's mm -hmm. what this chart tells you, right? Because, uh, you know, it, from the extreme point of the day, which is low or the high, the market has been reversing. So... Uh, and it's been, it, so it makes it that much more difficult for traders to na navigate. How do you do it? Uh, because uh, yesterday, who would have thought while the rest of the world was absolutely fine, the market here would sell off the way it did. Uh, with that said, let me just quickly run you through uh, a few things in terms of uh, takeoff from global markets, etc. as well. So last night, we had the U.S. markets, which rallied, but, you know, low volume, very low volume day. One and a half percent, which is great. The Nasdaq was up uh, about one and a half percent, a little more than that. Uh, and um, so that's good. But you have the, you have the dollar index, which is uh, back up, and you've got oil prices, which are higher. Uh, so we had the U.S. Consumer Conference Board uh, co sort of consumer survey in, for the month of December, which is rebounded in a very sharp way. This is surprising. Uh, and, you know, which basically means that the economy in the U.S., at least one data point is telling you, is not doing as badly. The dollar, as a result, moved up uh, back above 104 uh, oil inventories, this is the official uh, data, that fell and you had oil prices which are back at about $82 per barrel mark. So, uh, you know, just three cues, no, nothing very much in the rates market, yield market or anything of that sort. So, equities higher, oil higher and you have uh, dollar which is slightly up as well. The market here sold off and it's a bit puzzling, right? I mean, I heard reasons basically saying uh, this is because of the COVID scare. We put out a piece day before yesterday on Market Laser at 9 a.m. talking about how cases in China were rising and one needs to be cognizant of it because it may eventually lead other governments to be proactive, take notice, etc. But is that the only, is that the big uh, uh, sort of dominant reason why the market sold off? I think at the margin that may be, uh, but I think more than anything else, maybe, you know, market participants want, just want, were looking for an excuse for a reason to uh, sort of, you know, take profits off the table. And this got blamed. But I think at the margin, this is something which still needs to be watched. It's a serious situation in China and a few other countries. China, of course, being the epicenter of this uh, uh, thing now. But we explained this. This is natural as China reopens. Uh, on levels, Nifty yesterday finally uh, sort of breached the 40-day exponential moving average on a closing basis. Uh, supports are at the November low. We didn't get, get, get to the November lows yesterday, although we got very close to it, which is 18,133. And uh, very close to it, there is also the uh, rising channel from all the way from the June lows, absolute June bottom. You, uh, there's a trend line which is coming up, which now today will meet the Nifty at about 18,120. So there are supports in that 18,120, 18,130 kind of zone. For the bank Nifty, uh, it's once again closed around its 40-day uh, exponential moving average. Uh, and uh, uh, which is 42,485. That remains an important support. The uh, Bank Nifty closed above it. Uh, on the way up, the Nifty Bank, which is the stronger of the two indices, has been the 20-day for the Bank Nifty stands at 43,317. And then yesterday's high, which is at 43,615, also comes into play. So these are some levels. But as I said, and that graphic made the point very clear, you know, uh, what has worked is taking positions... Uh, not immediately from the gap up or the gap down, uh, although that, is, that may also work because many of these are from the opening gaps or the open, uh, opening gap up or the opening gap lows, but you don't want to chase things. I mean, that's basically, I think, the point. The market has been reversing from one extreme to the other extreme, or at least over the last five sessions, very, very volatile. Sonia. Oh, absolutely, Prashant. And, you know, uh, although the SGX Nifty is indicating that the start will be in the green today, yeah. 
uh, through the course of the day, you should be prepared for some volatility, right? Because uh, as you pointed out, not only that has been the case over the last many days, but if you look at the numbers, I mean, FII sold in a big way yesterday. FII sold over 1,000, 1,100 crores, although DII is compensated with that. And put together in December so far, FIs have sold almost 9,000 crores in the cash market. So there's definitely some trepidation as we head into the end of the year. Um, even if you look at individual names, right? I mean, if you go by what's happening in the FNO market, Market, there was a lot of long unwinding seen in some of the gainers of this year. So whether it's Adani Enterprises, Adani Ports, even if you look at this month so far, uh, stocks like Tata Motors, Maruti, Aishar have all lost about 8 to 10 percent. And these were a couple of big gainers. So perhaps the market is choosing to just take a little money off the table as we head into the end of the year. And there are these concerns about, uh, you know, uh, the China COVID situation. Having said all of that, perhaps the downside this morning could be protected because of the positive global cues. The U.S. markets were up over 500 points, the Dow that is. And I'm watching the 50-day moving average, which is at 18,143. That's perhaps a key level to watch on the downside. Remember... This 18,150 to 18,200 has proven to be a key support for the market. Uh, so let's see if that gets held. Initially, at least at the start of trade, things will be in the green. But as we said, there's so much volatility that just brace yourself for a lot of action uh, through the day. Hi, Sonia. Right now, at least the trends in the SGX Nifty is suggesting a positive start currently up. 110 points. You know, one more point about the U.S. markets because we had a very strong finish. One of the reasons attributed was the consumer confidence data, which came in at the highest level since April. But another reason is the Nike and FedEx. And both these two are seen as and considered as gauges of retail demand and the economic outlook. They both reported better than expected results in the United States. But a quick word on FedEx. The beat in FedEx was not driven by volumes. It was not driven by revenues. Revenues for FedEx actually declined 3%. If you look at the internals, the ground express volumes were roughly down 10%, which indicates that consumers are still reining back on uh, you know, spending uh, getting into the holiday season. So that's a bit of a you know, worry because the reason FedEx rallied was on aggressive co cost optimization plans. The company has indicated that their cost saving plans will be close to $3.7 billion in 2023, which is roughly equal to the annual profits of the company. So that's the reason why FedEx uh, rallied. It's not an account of volumes. It's an account of the beat in the bottom line due to the company's cost, uh, you know, optimization plans. Another word on uh, the IPO action. Today, Sula Vineyards, which is India's largest wine producer and seller, will be debuting on the bourses. This, remember, was a 960 crore pure offer for sale. It had seen a subscription of 2.3 times. And currently, the grey market premium is suggesting very mild gains. Another one closed yesterday. That is K-Fintech. Uh, the overall subscription was about 2.6 times. And remember, this is a direct competitor to CAMS. CAMS had you know, debuted in the bourses in 2020. At that time, this was also a pure offer for sale. But the kind of subscription CAMS got was 47 times. So in comparison, KFintech has seen muted subscription and, you know, CAM since its listing has done phenomenally well. The stock has rallied close to about 80 odd percent. So we'll watch for KFintech. The, just the short point is compared to its competitor, its direct competitor, it's seen muted subscription just about 2.6 times. The IPO closed yesterday. Okay, all that talk about Sula Vineyards got uh, <laughs> me quite thirsty considering that we're heading into a weekend as well. But just want to make one point, you know, I know that it's the largest winemaker and it has market share, etc. The only problem with Sula is that in the last four years, mm. the revenues of Sula have gone nowhere. I, mean, I think three, four years back, Sula revenues were about 520 crores. In fact, that's fallen to about 450 crores or so. So that's the only issue. Also, it's, uh, it still has debt on its books, considerable amount of debt, about 240 crores or so. And as Reema was saying, it was a pure OFS, so nothing goes to the company. So in that sense, perhaps you could see a bit of a muted listing uh, for Sula Vineyards, but that will definitely be uh, on our radar today. A couple of more things. First up, we have an equity call coming in from Chris Wood of Jefferies, and they've made some very interesting changes in their India long-only equity portfolio. Uh, they talk about REC. So they've made an investment in REC, which will be introduced with a 4% weighting. And Chris Wood says that this will be paid for by shaving the investments in HDFC Bank, Bajaj Finance, ICICI Pro Life and ICICI Lombard uh, by one percentage point each. So I guess uh, REC could be in focus today. All right. Uh, well, let's get you uh, <clears throat> some money market views now as well. Uh, Parul Mittal of Standard Chartered says that uh, the dollar INR has continued to face upward pressure 
Despite dollar weakness and lower oil prices, she expects the dollar INR pair to trade in a range of between 82.5 to 83 to the dollar next week. Uh, amid uh, low market liquidity in the end, towards the end of the year, she says with lower oil prices and recent rupee underperformance, any sharp uptick in the dollar INR pair is likely to be capped. On bonds, Parul Mittal Sinha says domestic yields have remained range-bound despite a sharp rise in global yields post the major central bank decision. She expects the 10-year benchmark yield to trade in a range of 7.25 to 7.4 percent next week post the hawkish December MPC minutes. She says with the key members worried about inflation persisting, she expects the market pricing of rate cuts in the second half of 2023 to be slowly ironed out. Okay, those are some views coming in, but we have lots of stock-specific action to track today. We'll get to that in just a bit in our special top 10 segment. We're looking at Reliance Industries, Bandhan Bank, Kalpatru Power, GMC Projects, Borosil, ONGC and Alkyl Amines. That's on our radar on the back of positive news flow. And then there's Ajanta Pharma, Max, Financial Services and Asian Pains that are likely to perhaps open in the red. Okay, uh, Priya Misra is Global Head of Rate Strategy at TD Securities. She's joining us now to take some questions. So, Priya, great to have you with us here. Thank you very much. Uh, you know, what, what is the uh, cue from the rates market, in your opinion, Priya, uh, in the U.S.? So, this week, I think we've seen a 20 basis point rise in the 10-year in the U.S. Uh, and, uh, but, I mean, uh, you know, uh, far away from the highs of the year. Uh, are, the, are we going to see a definitive kind of a move? or and, and what's the cue for other asset classes like equities? Sure. So thanks for having me on. I think there are two-sided risks uh, that we saw really through the month of November, early December. Interest rates in the U.S., particularly in the long end, declined. I think the, the, uh, the concern was one of recession. So, you know, with the Fed having raised 400 and almost 50 basis points this year, I think the concern was that they've overdone it. And so we, we've seen interest rates decline. A lot more uh, Fed interest rate cuts have been priced in, in, into the yield curve in 2024. I think that's the market saying that things are going to slow down this year. You know, inflation's going to uh, go down and that's going to allow the Fed to actually start to cut rates. So I think it was all recession fears. Now, as you talked about this week, we've had a big increase in interest rates. I think that's actually driven by what the ECB did at the end of last week, which was to be more hawkish, to, to uh, announce the start of quantitative tightening. And then you had the BOJ with a surprise uh, um, announcement uh, on, on uh, Monday night, which was essentially, get, you know, widening their yield curve control ban. So, you know, U.S. interest rates, I think, are driven by the fact that you've got, you know, the Fed that's still very hawkish. I actually think the market's underpricing how much the Fed will have to hike. Mm. I don't think inflation's going to come down that fast. So I think we've still got a little bit of a surprise in terms of how much the Fed might have to hike. But then I think the big tug of war is what about recession? You know, at what point does the Fed have to reverse course? So you talk about other asset classes. I think they're watching the same macro fundamentals which is, you know, um, when does the economy slow down? The economy is actually very strong right now. But when does it slow down? And then when can the Fed respond? And what I'm just concerned about is I think the market's used to having the Fed respond at the first sign of any slowdown. And I think this time around, they are going to be very slow to respond because inflation, I think, is just going to be very sticky on the way down. It's service driven, it's wage inflation. All that tends to be a lot more uh, slow moving rather than goods inflation. So I think that's going to be the big question for next year. OK, uh, Priya, hi, good morning. How are you reading into the China COVID situation? Although it may not be such a big health issue outside of China, the worry is that it may uh, put roadblocks in the form of, say, manufacturing, supply chain, travel, and that may eventually result in slower growth globally. Uh, is that your concern as well? It is. I think uh, our view has been for a while that, you know, the U.S. might actually be the strongest economy. Global growth is slowing. I think China COVID easing, our view was it was going to be a little more gradual easing. They've opened it up much faster than I think what anyone was looking for. And does that result in a health issue, which actually ends up backfiring? I think the what I'm watching for is, um, you know, on the supply chain front, as you highlighted, if there's an increase in supply chain constraints, that's going to put up put pressure on inflation, make the Fed go more, as well as other central, central banks go higher. Also, I'm watching for, is there any fiscal stimulus? You know, does, uh, particularly from China, that could actually offset some of the growth slowdown. So 
but you know right now without any any signs of fiscal stimulus i would say it's it's negative for growth it's a stagflationary shock it would be negative for growth and it could potentially put up put pressure on inflation but there is an upside risk in case you see the chinese authorities starting to put some fiscal stimulus in place maybe targeted but something around the property sector or you know just helping on, around the health uh, issues you know that could potentially put a floor on how bad things could get but i am concerned about the growth implications <clears throat> and the consumer might actually pull back significantly in in china uh, priya you said the markets are underpricing the amount of rate hikes the fed is likely to do next year what is your base case scenario how much more by way of uh, rate hikes from the fed sure so we're looking for five and a half uh, as the end point of the hiking cycle the market's pricing in about 5 4.9 is being priced in the fed themselves talked about five and a quarter so why are we higher than that and i would say the risks are even higher than five and a half is really the pace of decline in inflation i think we've gotten that low hanging fruit in terms of um, uh, you know the the decline in inflation that we've seen it's been supply chain uh, led it's been food energy but really we need service inflation the us consumption basket 75% of that is services we need the service inflation to come down and that i think is going to be sticky because wages are very high and that's why if you see chep owl particularly brought up service inflation brought up wage inflation and the labor market is still very tight in the us so we really need to see those wages downshift to a 3% 3.5% level they're running up, up over 5% before i think um, Uh, you know service inflation can come down and then the fed can stop so we think they they still have another four five more meetings they can downshift the pace we do think they're going to now hike at 25 maybe 50 basis point level so so go slower than the 75 they had been hiking this year but i think continue hiking until they see inflation you know sustaining around 2 and a half to 3% priya uh any sense on whether this what happens in the us and if your view plays out uh, i'm assuming uh, the dollar will be weaker right is that is that the sense uh, yes through It'll the be. course of the year we actually yeah. see weakening so, in the dollar so, right uh, so, now we see it a little bit more range bound okay no so if the dollar is weaker broadly i mean that's a bigger trend uh, the general understanding is uh, when we spoken with uh, more other others the sell side as well out of the us that Uh, it's good news for emerging market flows into emerging markets any thoughts yeah i think once the fed starts you know stops hiking they potentially start to ease mm. i think at that point real interest rates in the us should start to come down and then i do think you're going to see flows into emerging market you know do we see broad based flows i think i think investors are going to be more discerning in general i would say when cost of capital goes up discipline comes back and so i think they, you know it may not be a you know something that helps every emerging market i think there'll be a lot more differentiation in terms of you know which emerging market economies are doing well i think china is going to struggle on that front because i don't see their growth picture Uh, you know other parts of ems i think can can outperform but yeah i think the flows into emerging markets should start to increase through the course of of uh, you know 2023 i don't see it in the first half i see it more in the second half when the fed starts to ease okay well in case we don't see you again before the new year which in all likelihood we won't considering there are just a few days left a uh, happy new year to you in advance and to your entire team uh, thanks a lot for joining in and um, wishing everyone at td securities a great year ahead Thank you. Okay, well that's a word coming in on the macro situation, but let's do a, uh, a quick break now. On the other side, our list of top 10 stocks and many important discussions coming up uh, with some experts in just a bit. Stay tuned.
फाइनेंस लिमिटेड आपकी प्रगति का साथी उत्तर वीर कमाल दिखा अपना कभी टेबल बन जाता है तो कभी अलमारी वीर एम डी एफ आम प्लाईवुड ऐसी ज्यादा मजबूत ज्यादा किफायती दिखे चकाचक दिखे टकाटक डिफरेंट एजेस डिफरेंट स्टेजेस गेट बेस्ट प्रोटेक्शन विद स्टार वुमेन केयर इंश्योरेंस पॉलिसी ऑलवेज एट यू टो स्टेप क्या हुआ चैंपियन दिन रात प्रैक्टिस करनी पड़ती है यहाँ तो रात को स्टेडियम ही बंद हो जाता है एक काम करो ना छह छोड़ छोड़ के लगाना पापा अब करो दिन रात प्रैक्टिस चैंपियन एक्स्ट्रा सेफ पॉलीकैप ग्रीन वायर आपके सपनों को रखे सेफ Retail investors should develop the habit of examining and reviewing their transactions and trading accounts on a periodic basis. Make sure there are no surplus funds lying idle in your account. It is also advisable to insist on regular settlement of your trading account. Smart investors opt for a monthly or quarterly settlement to keep track of both funds and securities. If you notice any discrepancy or error, you need to immediately bring it to the notice of your broker and get satisfactory response within reasonable time. For unresolved issues, Contact your nearest NSC Investor Service Center for assistance. Soch kar, samajh kar, invest kar. Soch kar, samajh kar, invest kar. NSC द्वारा निवेशकों के हित में जारी. Welcome back to Bazaar Morning Call this morning. The SGX Nifty is indicating a bright shade of green, and that's how we're going to begin. But then we'll take it from there. It's been a volatile last few days. Let's get our research team to tell you about the list of top ten stocks to watch. And Reliance Industries is top of mind this morning. Mangalam has the fine print on that. Mangalam, over to you. Well, late last night we did get uh, the notification on the exchange that Reliance has gone ahead and bought Metro AG's cash and carry business in India for about twenty-eight fifty odd crore rupees. There were uh, rumours that this deal would come by, and now it is official. Metro AG, of course, is a leading international food wholesaler. The India business, they have 31 large format stores and 7,700 crore rupees in terms of revenues. So, you know, uh, just from a price to sales standpoint, this is an attractive uh, deal that Reliance has. And importantly, we need to watch out for what they do with the profitability and scale uh, the synergies of the company as well. And do they move this business vertically as well as horizontally? Do they go apart from cash and carry into whole wholesale retail as well? Currently, the metro cash and carry business in India supplies to a lot of Kirana and other small businesses, and that is what Reliance likes as well. They say that this will further strengthen their physical store footprint. But apart from that, uh, they get access to a wide network of uh, stores located in prime locations. But they also get a large base of registered Kiranas and institutional customers, along with a strong supplier network. So, from an ecosystem standpoint, this is a positive, and the valuation that they've given is attractive as well. See green. All right. Uh, thanks very much, uh, Magalam, for that. So that's something we'll touch base on with an analyst in a bit from now as well, in terms of implications. But Ajanta Pharma is the next one which we're talking about. Vivek is standing by with more. Vivek, hi. Well, uh, good morning. So Ajanta Pharma, you know, sources indicate to us that we are uh, expecting a largish block deal in this particular name. Now, two promoter group entities are anticipated to sell close to 4.56 percent stake in the company, and you know, this particular stake uh, you're expecting almost a little over 600. 50 crores to change hands in today's anticipated block deal. Now the lower end of the price range is at uh, 1,113 rupees, which indicates almost a 5% discount to yesterday's closing price. So who are the promoter entities? You know, two trusts, uh, uh, Ayush Agarwal Trust and Ravi Agarwal Trust. Both of these trusts hold a little over 14.3% stake in the company. And interestingly, you know, there's a 90-day lock-in on further sale of shares. So I expect this particular stock to open in the red, and depending on the demand that this particular block sees, uh, you know, it'll be interesting. To see whether this particular stock recovers, the stock actually underperformed peers even as the pharma pack rallied yesterday. Thank you very much for that. Let's get to Bandhan Bank. Abhishek is here to tell us more. Abhishek. Well, good news for Bandhan Bank, uh, given the fact that they have been able to sell uh, their written off portfolio to an ARC. So, bank has received binding bid from an ARC, so they will receive 800 and 801 crore on the in terms of security receipts, which is a 1585 uh, kind of a ratio, where 15 per uh, 10% is actually coming in. Sorry, 10% is actually coming in as close to security receipts, while the 1991% is going to ARC. So, a uh, written off portfolio is about 8,900 crore. Um, 
mainly or largely made up of the individual loans which have been written off over the last few quarters. The bank shall go uh, uh, bidding uh, for bidding as per the Swiss uh, challenge method. Now, sources do tell us that the bid has come from an ARC. Uh, so, bid likely to have come from a big bank and an ARC together. So, ARC plus an investor is there for the bid of, uh, you know, bad assets in Bandhan Bank. So, board uh, meet will happen next week to consider and approve of the same and also release the name of the ARC as well as the investor. Back to you. Okay, thanks a lot for that. Well, let's go back to Vivek now and talk about Kalpa through Power and JMC projects. Vivek, over to you. Uh, well, that's right. You know, both of the companies that had initiated a merger project of Kalpataru Power and uh, JMC projects, you know, this particular merger will fructify soon. The NCLT, the National Company Law Tribunal, has approved the merger of both of these companies. So the combined entity will now be quite a significant entity, uh, diversified engineering and construction company, order book, a consolidated order book of a little over 38,000 crore rupees and order visibility of almost 43,000 crore rupees. Now, analysts believe that this is a significant positive development as far as Kalpataru is concerned. They believe that merger synergies here will be quite significant. Uh, remember, the merger ratio is uh, one share of Kalpataru power for four share held in JMC projects. Interesting to see how the stock reacts. It's a positive development as far as both of these companies are concerned. All right. Uh Prima, Tata Communications uh, in focus as well? Well, they've done an acquisition. So Tata Communication is going to be acquiring a company called Switch Enterprise for 486 crore. Now, this, according to the company, this acquisition of Switch will provide a direct upsell opportunity for Tata Communications offerings. It will help them um, you know, expand their video connect business and it will expand their presence in Europe as well as North America. So these are the synergies and the driving factors, the rationale for this acquisition. As I said, 486 crore is what the company is paying. The acquired company had revenues of 675 crore rupees. The acquisition will be completed in the next four to six months and the company will be paying all the amount in cash. The stock, however, is down 13% so far this year. Okay, so that's on Tata Communications. But Surbhi is with us. She's tracking Max Financial Services and Boro still this morning. Surbhi, over to you. Hi, thanks for that. So the first one is Max Financial, where Max Ventures Investment Holdings, a promoter of the company, has sold close to 59 lakh shares for 400 crore rupees to an open market, uh, open market transaction yesterday. The shares were sold at an average cost of 679 rupees per share. Following the sale, the share holding of the promoter has come down to 13% uh, versus 14.72% previously. Next is Borosul, where the company has commenced trial production for Opel Wearglass in its Jaipur plant. The plant has an additional capacity of 42 tons per day. All right, Borosul and Focus will be thanks for that. Alkyla Mines and Balaji Mines, etc. should be in focus. Sonal is here with more on this. Sonal, hi. Good morning, Prashant. Well, yes, these two stocks will be in focus because DGTR has recommended extension of anti-dumping duty on monoisopropylamine imports. Uh, now, it's again just a recommendation and still needs to be notified by the Finance Ministry. But on the back of this, could see some green on the stock today. Now, anti-dumping duty on monoisopropylamine imports is from China, which will continue for five years according to the recommendation. And it is alkyl amines which had gone ahead and put in this request for extension of this anti-dumping duty. We don't know the exact uh, percentage in terms of contribution of revenues coming in from this product, but it will be a positive because this will safeguard them in terms of dumping of these products in the country. Okay, thanks a lot for that. So, Sorry, did you, uh, Sonal, can you say that? Uh, the, the name Mono of the isopropylamine. <laughs> <laughs> say it again, slowly. <laughs> Mono isopropylamine. No, I, I lost her at Mono. <laughs> repeat it, you have to three that times. Uh, I'll teach you all offline. <laughs> Shant, I think you need to repeat it now. You've heard it three times, now you need to repeat what she said. There's one thing I hated with all my, uh, all passion is chemistry. <laughs> going up, so I, <laughs> I pretty so. much lost her at Mono. I was like, okay, she knows what she's talking. <laughs> I don't need to listen to that. <laughs> Alright, thanks a lot Sonal for, ex for that explainer. Mm -hmm. But uh, let's move on and talk about uh, the price of crude which has gone up actually over $2 a barrel on the back of a drawdown in the US crude uh, stockpiles. Manisha Gupta is here to keep, give us a quick lowdown on all that's been happening there. Manisha, morning. Sonia, thank you for that. Well, he has 2% of gains in the overnight market and a surprise decline in the crude inventories in US by 3.1 million barrels clearly has taken the prices higher. So we are holding above $82 per barrel right now. Also, after the G7 sanctions, we've seen a complete collapse from Russia in sense of Seaborne. 
seaborne crude oil export, that seems to be supporting prices also. And then the markets are looking at Chinese reopening the months of November and December. Until now, in terms of loading, have been on the positive side on a year-on-year basis, and that is clearly supportive. But not just crude. I mean, I quickly want to tell you that gold prices are trading <clears throat> pardon me, at a five-month high. You have copper prices gaining up by 2% in this week. Sugar is trading at a six-year high. So I've been three-month highs, cotton at two-month highs, silver at eight-month highs. Steel prices are back. I know it's trading at a six-month highs. So commodities have started Asia on a very strong footing. Okay, Manisha, thank you very much for that. Let's do a quick recap then of the top stocks this morning. This Thursday morning, stocks with positive news flow are Reliance, Bandhan Bank, Kalpataru Power Transmission, JMC Project, Stata Communications, Borosil, ONGC, Alkalamine Chemicals, while stocks with negative news flow are Ajanta Pharma and Max Financial Services. Okay, we'll discuss all of these stocks and more on the other side of the break. Market expert Dilip Bhatt will be joining in for some fundamental stock analysis. We'll also discuss Reliance Retail's acquisition of Metro AG's Cash and Carry India with Shirish Pardeshi of Centrum. We'll also connect with Dr. Gagandeep Kang and Rahul Guha of Thyrocare to discuss the rising concerns in the country over the surge of COVID cases in China and what the impact may be. Stay tuned for that. Welcome back. The SJX Nifty is still higher in trade, up close to about 100 odd points. Let's get that up for you on your screen. The rest of the Asian markets, too, are trending in the green right now. Market expert Dilip Bhatt is with us on the show now. Uh, Dilip, morning, and thanks so much for joining in. Reliance is strengthening its dominant position now in the retail sector with the acquisition of Metro. Your thoughts on this particular deal and what it means for Reliance and the competitors in the space? Good morning. I think uh, this deal was very much in the offing and uh, it is very clear that with the Geo as a background and uh, Reliance Retail trying to uh, consolidate their move very much in this particular space. And I think uh, without any doubt, this uh, deal is certainly very uh, uh, positive for Reliance uh, without any doubt in the long run. But in the short run, how they transit to being a consumer-centric uh, business house from being a B2B business house is what possibly remains a broad challenge in terms of understanding how they are going to fare. So I think, yes, for Reliance, it's one move further and further consolidation in this particular space. And I think with this, we uh, continue to be quite positive on Reliance without any doubt. But uh, in the long run, how they will fare, that is what remains to be seen as they become a little, a lot more consumer uh, centric. Okay, that's on Reliance. Of course, we'll get you more details from an analyst in just a bit. Uh, Dilip, hi, good morning, and thanks for joining in. Uh, greetings of the season to you. I wanted your thoughts on a sector like cement because now there is a common narrative that uh, cement is entering into a structural upcycle. One, of course, there's pre-election demand, but there is also a pickup in manufacturing and real estate, uh, you know, and that perhaps will aid the cement sector both in terms of pricing and volumes. Your thoughts and which are the cement names that you like for the long run? Well, I think with the entry of uh, um, Adani's in this particular business, I think they will make it uh, much more proactive in terms of trying to consolidate the, uh, the overall uh, cement business. Uh, within the industry and uh, well i think cement as far as uh, the cement industry goes it was uh, it had been uh, like capex cycle you know a lot has been spoken about the capex cycle and the demand for cement and the demand for uh, because of the infra some or the other for last couple of years it has not really materialized on a very sustainable basis and of course we have seen the resultant impact on the uh, 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 the cement prices and of course the cost has always been a very worrying factor for them hopefully i think what we are going to see right now probably in 23 and 24 the capex cycle really uh, uh going up 
And of course, the, uh, the infra spend will continue to be one of the dominant features for this government uh, as we move into the election year. So uh, looking at that, uh, cement industry possibly could just uh, turn around right now and possibly the EBITDA per ton, which is one of the key parameters which all of us watch, possibly could go northwards as the cost also become a lot more sober for them. So in that sense, I think uh, the cement industry possibly uh, can do pretty well in uh, 23 and 24. So within the space, I think Ultratech continues to look pretty good and pretty interesting for us. I think that is uh, one stock which one should uh, really look at. And apart from that, I think uh, I wouldn't really be too keen to look at ACC or uh, Gujarat Ambuja at this particular stage as they get into a very uh, huge capex cycle, and uh, maybe the uh, the dilution also will be huge. So within this space, let's focus on ultra tech and may possibly a Shri Cement. Dilip, uh, any uh, <coughs> market intel in terms of what happened yesterday, the big sell-off that we saw? Any any dominant driver? To your mind? Uh, in my opinion, I think uh, too many moving parts. Uh, if you if you saw day before yesterday, Bank of Japan surprised everyone by their move. I think then the reports of the uh, the COVID related pandemic uh, also surfacing, and uh, not to forget the fact that uh, we are getting into a very uncharted territory, which is quantitative tightening. And this is not what all of us have experienced in the last uh, maybe uh, even 20, 25 years. And against a backdrop of an interest rate where possibly it appears that mm. in full of calendar year 23, we are going to witness a very high interest rate. Got it. Got so it. So there are uh, too many moving parts, too many headwinds just the, at the moment. Just the, cumulative impact, just the cumulative impact, right? I mean, no one kind of trick. I was just wondering what many people were saying, this COVID or whatever. But I said, well, it more, seems more like an excuse to... Uh, but we've seen these large swings last five sessions. Dilip, another space which saw a very large sell-off is PSU banks. You know, I was just looking at it. PSU banks yesterday, high to low, lost six... The index lost 6%. Uh, aggressive sell-off. In the morning, they were all up 4, 5, 6%. And they closed at the low point, 6% of the highs. Uh, what, what's your prognosis here? Public sector banks, one of the strongest sectors of 2022. Uh, is this a pause? And will there, is, the, is momentum going to come back into the space? Go on. Sure. I think uh, the PSU banks, as we all know, have moved up quite a bit in the last six months. If I'm correct, the returns they have given in the last six months is much more than what they had given in the last 10 years. So that speaks a lot. So I think whenever you see that kind of a strong, uh, euphoric kind of uh, move, some kind of sobering down of the prices and uh, possibly uh, some of these uh, corrections provide an opportunity. So I think as far as the PSU banks are uh, concerned, on a longer term basis, next one, one and a half year, they still have a reasonable steam to go ahead. Uh, uh, so a correction can be looked upon as buying some of these banks uh, for next one, one and a half, two years. But I'm not too sure whether I would be too keen to recommend these uh, PSU banks uh, from the current level, knowing the, the DNA of the banks don't really change overnight. And though they are starting on a very clean slate with uh, uh, cleaner NPAs and with uh, higher NIMs and higher NIM and credit growth, all that, uh, having said that, I still don't think I would be too comfortable recommending PSU banks uh, on a broader basis, maybe SBI, yes, maybe Bank of Baroda, yes. But beyond that, one has to be extremely choosy and selective. Okay, well, uh, thanks for that. Uh, I agree, PSU banks have had their fair share of a run-up as well, right? Uh, almost uh, doubling of prices in this year. Uh, so perhaps you want to be a bit cautious now, but stay on, Dilip, we'll come back to you. We were discussing Reliance Retail acquiring Metro AG's cash and carry business for 28.50 crores. Now, Metro AG is a leading international food wholesaler which operates 31 large stores in India. The acquisition will further strengthen Reliance Retail's physical store footprint as it gets access to a wide network of Metro India stores in prime locations and a supplier network. Uh, Shirish Pardeshi, who is the FMCG analyst at Centrum, joins in now to talk about that. Shirish, good morning. Uh, what is your analysis of what this acquisition would bring to the table for Reliance Retail? And what kind of you know numbers do you see? What could the growth contribution be? I think two things, uh, uh, Sonia, good morning. Uh, thanks for having me on the show. Uh, if you actually analyze, uh, Metro uh, has uh, done a fantastic work over the last one and a half decade uh, in their presence. Uh, 
I think uh, the second point which is there is that they have created an asset at a prime location, but um, never to mind that uh, the footprint in terms of connect with the retailer. I think that's one of the strongest asset uh, which will work in favor of Reliance. Uh, of course, the omni-channel strategy and the physical network uh, will be handy, uh, but you have to also keep in mind that over the last five years, even Reliance Geo footprint has grown exponentially well. Now, if you look at this marriage, uh, I think uh, two things will work. One is that obviously there is a cost synergy uh, because these all assets are sitting in the prime location. So your delivery cost and supply chain is one of the crucial asset uh, which will supplement your front-end network. That's one part. Second, uh, obviously there will be some overlap of the Kirana, but you have to also keep in mind that Metro has built its brand in the food retail uh, very strong. And I think that's will, that will definitely complement. But, but, but the bigger challenge which I see that uh, uh, and, and the reason why Metro has been uh, stretching its uh, thoughts over the last four or five years, I think the scale at which uh, the expectations were to build. And that's where the challenging part which comes in because uh, to my personal view, uh, having seen the industry for many decades, I think today's uh, Indian Kirana retail, uh, which is a large network, what we call it as a general trade. Uh, I think uh, historically, this these people have been struggling to get the assortment right, and second, uh, to get the uh, assortment right in a whatever so-called 500, 700 square feet store. I think the turnover is one of the key uh, important factor, and obviously, digital is one of the way which has taught most of the retailers. I think if Reliance with its sheer size, if been able to improve their throughput, I think that is going to be a winning story for most of the retailers. Uh, at the end, yeah. the, go ahead. Yeah, at the at the end, the growth rate is depending on uh, the the scale at which you are growing. But I think over a period of time, there are many regional models have been able to uh, give a tough competition. Uh, what we say, B two B wholesale. And I think that's where one thing uh, one has to keep a, a watch out. Uh, Shreesh, thoughts on the valuation, the price at which Reliance has acquired it, 2850 uh, I would not get into the valuation part. See, these all assets are more important and strategically located. And these all strategy uh, fitment will happen and it will deliver the required, uh, uh, say, in terms of turnover and profitability over a period of time. But at this point of time, if Reliance is growing stronger in terms of network and distribution and creating uh, its its own size, I think you might say that uh, on a 7,800, 9,000, 8,000 8, crore revenue, it's one of the cheapest asset which they would have bought. But what you have to keep in mind that uh, the, the, the valuation is at that point of time because you know the pain uh, by the uh, seller and maybe buyer would have uh, got those things right. So I'm not getting into valuation. It is all uh, in the eyes uh, of the buyer. All right. We'll leave it at that, Shirish. Thanks a lot for giving us your quick take uh, on uh, the acquisition that Reliance has made. And um, have a great new year. Thanks a lot for joining in. Well, uh, moving on, uh, the biggest story yesterday, and perhaps one of the reasons why the markets in India fell, is because after two months, the Union Health Minister has chaired a meeting of the COVID task force as inve infections have risen across China. Now, the central government has urged all states to conduct genome sequencing of positive samples to keep track of emerging variants. The advisory to citizens is to wear a mask in crowded places, even as the government insists that there is no reason to panic. We are now joined by Dr. Gagandeep Kang, the professor of microbiology at Christian Medical College, Velour, and Rahul Guha, the MD and CEO at Thyrocare, to give us a sense of what's happening on the ground. Uh, Dr. Kang, good morning, and Rahul, morning to you as well. Uh, Dr. Kang, I want to start with you. Although there is no reason to panic, it's always better from the government's end, I guess, to be proactive, and that's what they're doing. Uh, but for the people watching you right now, what is your advice? It's no different from what has uh, been happening in the past. Uh, you know, this idea that everybody must suddenly start to mask up is uh, I don't think completely appropriate because I think we have to think about why we want to wear masks. And certainly for people who are vulnerable to protect themselves, it's important to wear masks, not just 
from today onwards, it's been something that has been important to prevent respiratory infections ever since we realized the value of masks two years ago. And for people who are infected with COVID, not just with any specific variant, it's important to make sure that if you encounter other people, then you should be wearing masks to prevent spread of infection to others. This applies not just for COVID-19, it applies to any respiratory infection, including influenza. Mm. Ma'am, uh, the <clears throat> current, uh, I guess the <clears throat> reason why this is, is what's happening in China, right? I mean, they're finally reopening and uh, naturally cases are on the rise. Uh, uh, so, and uh, from, from that perspective, I mean, uh, is there a need for more vigilance incrementally, in your opinion? Well, I think there was never a need to relax vigilance mm. on the part of government mm. in order to be able to detect strains that are circulating in other parts of the world as well as in our country. So a standardized surveillance looks at all severe respiratory viral infections and identifies those causes of severe respiratory virus infection. Mm. This is something that should continue. It should be ramped up when there is a threat in your population, such as with outbreaks, where sequencing should be intensified. Or if you think that there is going to be virus that is going to come to you from other parts of the world, you could look at, as the government is doing, screen for new variants yeah. that let might me, be brought into the country. Ma'am, let, yeah, let, let me ask you uh, very pointedly, is there uh, any... Uh, is, there, is there risk? Is there additional risk uh, because of COVID? I know, I know what you're saying. No. no, you're saying no. Nothing has changed. No, I'm saying, saying no because yeah. the situation in India is not the situation in China. Exactly. China is in for a bad time. Yeah. They are going to have a lot of infections. Mm. They are going to have high levels of mortality, particularly in their elderly population, because they have not had prior exposure to the waves of virus that we have seen. Mm. And because their population has received mostly only two doses of vaccine without a booster. And that's very important for the elderly population. In India, we have the advantage of hybrid immunity. We have experienced all the waves of the virus. And therefore, our population has effectively been immunized not only by our strong immunization program, but also by the fact that we have had high levels of exposure. So severe disease and mortality are unlikely to happen in India as they will happen in China. Mm. But there are two specific aspects we need to consider. One is that this is an Omicron variant, which in general is not as bad as the Delta variant. But the second thing that we have to remember is any time the virus replicates at a very, very high level, the chances for mutations and of new variants arising become high. So being watchful about what emerges from China is very important. Uh, well said, ma'am. Uh, Rahul Guha, the MD and CEO of Thyrocare, is also with us on the show now. Uh, Mr. Guha, if you could tell us what is it that you are observing in terms of COVID-19 testing, has it gone up? What are the trends currently? Thanks. Thanks. Uh, I think uh, for us overall, I think COVID-19 testing over the last few days has been kind of in line with what it used to be. So we aren't seeing a spike in testing at this point in India. But we always believe, you know, prepare for the worst and hope for the best. So at least at Thyrocare, we are gearing up. We are ensuring that our labs are ready. Until now, we have processed almost 50 lakh, more than 50 lakh COVID samples at Thyrocare. And we're just ensuring we're geared up to meet the needs of the nation uh, should the need arise. Okay. Uh, can you tell us a little bit about, okay, so you're saying at the moment there is not no spike in COVID testing, but you are prepared in terms of if there is any kind of, you know, fallout of what's happening in China. 
Uh, is there is this uh, the situation the same along the industry? I mean, is the entire industry prepared? And this time around, are there any special um, protocols being put in place? Is there any preparation being done from not just uh, from a path lab standpoint, but from an industry standpoint? I think uh, because of the volumes of COVID testing being so down over the last uh, six months, uh, I think the supply chains have not been tested for a spike. Uh, so, you know, just getting ready in case there is a spike, I don't think our supply chains right now are ready, uh, you know, with the kind of uh, inventory required of kits, reagent, as well as, you know, just the lab readiness. Uh, so I think uh, just recognizing, you know, that if there might be a spike, and I, I fully agree with Dr. Uh, Kang that at this point, you know, there's nothing to panic. But uh, in the situation in which we see a variant, a new variant into the Indian population, we are just making sure at Thyrocare that, you know, our supply chain is at the same level of efficiency, you know, let's say one year ago when we were processing the level of samples that we could and making sure the supply chain is ready. Uh, Dr. Kang, just one more question. Yesterday, we had Dr. B.K. Paul who said that only 27 to 28% of India's eligible population has taken the precautionary COVID-19 dose. Do you think there is going to be a drive from the government to increase uh, this booster dose to make sure that more eligible percentage of the population takes this booster precautionary dose? Is that something that we, we should expect from the government? I think it would be really good to also see data from the government to show us the effectiveness of the vaccines that we've seen so far. And that would help us decide on why and which kinds of populations really need a booster dose. Right. It's very clear from the rest of the world that the elderly and those with comorbidities definitely need an additional level of protection that they could get from booster doses. But for the general population, which has had two doses, which has had a high level of infection, is a booster dose really necessary? I have not seen that data from India as yet. All right, uh, Dr. Kang, thanks very much, Rahul. Great to have you with us here. Appreciate you joining in with that. By the way, look at the uh, moves yesterday. I was looking at the thyrocare chart. Uh, it went up a uh, hundred bucks, basically. You know, fifteen. 15, 16 percent out of the after uh, Dr. Lal and uh, Metropolis, Thyrocare was the one which uh, was up 15 percent. That was a big one. Volumes were some of the highest we've seen at least in the last four months. We'll take a break here. We're back. There's, uh, we're running into market uh, pre-open pre at least. Nine minutes to go. Our technical experts will be with us on the other side. Gap up opening on the card. So how should you position for trade today? Sudarshan Sakhani and Mitesh Thakkar are with us now. Sudarshan, first, the Nifty call and the trade for the day. Well, uh, the markets are now a little more of a random uh, nature rather than anything else. Yesterday, surprisingly, the Nifty decided to fall when, it, when the expectation was that it would be stable. So my view now for the Nifty is take only intraday trades, and which is what I plan to do myself. Use a simple trend-following intraday strategy, either a moving average or higher highs, lower lows, and take the trades during the day. Do not carry positions till we get some sense of stability in the Nifty. So primarily, it becomes an intraday trading environment based on how the markets open and behave in the first one hour. Okay, got that. Uh, we'll come back to you for stocks. Let's get a word in from Mitesh as well. Uh, Mitesh, morning. What are you expecting on the Nifty? And if you can also tell us what are the stocks that you're looking at today? Sure. Good morning. So on the index day yesterday, I mentioned that we are not trading the index because uh, it's basically uh, in a range of about 18,200, give and take a few points to about 18,450. Again, give and take a few points on the upside. Very choppy within this range. So uh, 100 point gap up would suggest an opening around 18,300, 320 levels, somewhere in the middle of the uh, area. So I will not be again trading the index today. Unless until we get closer to the upper boundary, which uh, around 18,450, I've maintained that you know short positions can be looked into. Uh, having said that, I think today I've got more of buy calls on the stock, uh, stock side, three buys to a sell. Exide is something which I like a lot. That's a buy with a stop at 185 for a first target of 194. A similar setup on the charge of Power Finance Corporation, it's come to support areas. That's a buy with a stop at 135 for targets of 145. And Nestle is a buy 
with a stop at 20,200 for 2850 as the target area. On the sell side is SBI cards. If it breaks a pivot of 785, go short, keep a stop above 800 and look for a target of 755. Right. Uh, <clears throat> thanks for that, uh, Mitesh. Uh, Sudarshan, what about you? What are your trades? Well, uh, primarily look at this as an intraday trading opportunity only. Granules is a buy. Yesterday, all pharma stocks suddenly started going up. Well, granules has a, a much deeper correction. Perhaps uh, it can hold on to its gains. So buy with a stop under 323. HCL Tech is another buying opportunity. As I've already said, keep the trades uh, primarily intraday. Buy with a stop under 1030. India Cement is an intraday short. Uh, the stock has been in a mini bear market of its own. Keep a stop above 239. And finally, Can Bank continues to be a buying opportunity. This is the only positional trade that I could suggest. Stop under 309. Okay, gentlemen, thank you very much for that. Get into a short break. We'll come back with the pre-opening rates. We'll also connect with Yurkina, the MD and CIO of Swiss Asia Capital, to discuss the outlook for commodities in 2023. Stay tuned.